Okay, we're all back. Yay! Oh, Georgia, you're muted. I love it when technology works. Yeah, here we are. Yes. Here we are. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. Uh, I am your co-host, Nicole Gallucci, with the CosmoQuest Project. And my co-host through the wall, Georgia mm -hmm. Bracey, is with us. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Um, if you've been following our Twitter feeds and, and things, I've just returned from Balticon, so a little bit tired, but don't seem to have the con crud yet, which is lovely. Um, we uh, are going to be discussing um, a topic brought up uh, in a previous show by a commenter, and it wasn't necessarily something we could expand upon in that show, and so I decided we'd have a whole show about it. Uh, so they asked um, what teachers should do to deal with uh, classroom situations around questions of, say, creationism, uh, things that are controversial, and I'm using scare quotes, controversial uh, scientific topics, or at least topics about science that will come up in the classroom uh, in the science classroom that may be uh, controversial to some people. Uh, and so I've invited Josh Rosen out to join us. Hello. Hello, thanks for having me. Yay, I'm excited. Um, we, we, I was on a panel with you at DragonCon last year. Yeah, a couple years back. A couple years back, yeah, and yeah. I was like token astronomer person. <laughs> and I was just in <laughs> awe of you and Eugenie Scott, so it was, it was fun. Um, so I brought you on to, to help us talk about that. A few particulars, first of all. Uh, if you would like to join the discussion, you can do so using the Q&A app. We will be watching that for comments. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching this embedded somewhere, which I forgot to do on the CosmoQuest page, <laughs> if you are, doing, if you are um, watching this on Google+, Plus, you can click on the um, little thing on the screen that says join the conversation, go to the Q&A app. And I see we've got a bunch of hellos from people, from Guido, uh, from uh, Atsuran, Atsuran, hello. Michael Jobin, hello. Guido says everyone seems to have survived Balticon. I'll let you know. <laughs> so um, we've survived in one way or another. Nancy Graziano, who was at Balticon, super helping us out at the table. So thank you, Nancy. Um, Excellent. Hey, everybody. Yes. Uh, and Oh, and Fal Falconio, Fal oh, I keep moving around, Falconio Kronos is joining us as well. So thanks, guys. Uh, please feel free to uh, join us in the comments and ask questions along the way. Um, so let's get started. Um, Josh, why don't you uh, tell us who you are, a little bit of your background, and and um, maybe, I know this is asking a lot all at once, but we'll, we'll go through uh, your work at the National Center for Science Education. Sure. So I, I can talk a little bit about both of those at once, because <laughs> I, I was a, a graduate student in ecology and evolutionary biology in Kansas starting in 2000, and you may remember that some crazy stuff was going on in the state school board in the mid-2000s, and so there I was, evolutionary biologist, evolution's under attack, mm -hmm. uh, and I got involved in that effort there, and it turned out that I was having a lot more fun with it than I was with my research. Nicole knows nothing about that. I don't know anything about that research, feeling. Right? <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, a position opened up at, at NCSE to, to do what I had been doing for fun and actually get paid for it. So I was like, yay. Nice. Excellent. And so a lot of what we do is a lot of, you know, it's working with teachers, it's working with parents, um, communities. When there's a problem in, in schools, helping them make sure that evolution is taught, that climate change is taught, that these topics that are politically controversial, that certainly in society we spend a lot of time debating, um, but that are not scientifically controversial, that they're taught accurately, that, that science is taught as science. Yeah. Tell more about the fun part, because to me what you do, it seems like there's a lot of conflict, right? There's a lot of debate, and what do you, obviously, you know, you sort of get a lot out of that, and, and what do you really find that draws you to that and made you make that move? I mean, part of it is just, it's, there, there's the adrenaline of, of being in a little bit of a, of a scuffle, but <laughs> it's also the, you know, the parents or, or the teachers who call us and say, you know, a, a teacher who calls and says, I'm teaching evolution and I'm getting parents coming in and complaining, what do I do? Mm -hmm. By the time the teacher has, gets to us, they've probably 
been doing, spending a lot of time obsessing over this and trying to think of what can they do? How do they get themselves out of this mess? Because they know what the science is. They know what they're supposed to be teaching. Every professional society of teachers and science teachers and scientists that they look at is telling them teach evolution, teach it thoroughly, put it at the beginning of the class, run it through. It's the foundation of modern biology. And, but they live in a community where that's not how people see it. So by the time they get to us, they're, they're often really feeling down and really feeling like they don't know what they're supposed to do. But they do. You know, they, they're, they're doing the right thing. And so it's really gratifying to be able to just step in and give them a pat on the back. And, and that's 90% of it, is just saying, your, your instinct is right. Yeah, you're doing right. the right thing. Uh, here, here's, how, here's how we can help. Here's what's going on. You know, here are some resources that would help you out. Do you need to write a letter? Do you want me to look over your shoulder at it? Here are some people. Here, NCSE, I will say, is a membership organization. Mm -hmm. Membership is $35. It's cheap. And by becoming a member, you're in our database. And if something happens in your community, we'll call you and say, hey, there's this teacher who's in trouble. There's going to be a meeting. Uh, would you be willing to go with the teacher? Would you be willing to sit with the principal and say how glad you are that they're teaching evolution? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, or if there's something in the state legislature or a state board of education is considering science standards, we might ask you to write a letter. Uh, but there's only, you know, we're, we're here in California in the Bay Area. If we write a letter, they're going to be like, why are those hippies writing to us and trying to tell us how to run our school, right? Yeah. It, it's no good. It's, it's mm -hmm. much better if it's coming from someone in the community who we can talk to, uh, who, who maybe they, you know, they know them. They stood mm -hmm. in line at the supermarket together. Their kids went through the schools. They're a voter. This matters to policymakers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it means much more for it to come from someone local than for it to come from us. So a lot of what we're doing is helping people on the ground who basically know what they have to do but just need a little bit of help, a little bit of encouragement. And, yeah, that's, that's incredibly gratifying. Yeah. What Definitely. are some... Um... I don't know if you can generalize on some situations that uh, teachers have brought to you and, and whether where their issues are coming from. Is it coming from in the classroom at the moment? Is it coming from parents after school? Oh, and like, it, uh, yeah, it varies. A lot of times the kids in class are not the ones who are, who are doing things. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually going to be, because, I mean, partly just because kids don't know. And so, and this is why it's so dangerous if a teacher is teaching denial, you know, the teacher's saying, oh, climate change isn't real. Oh, evolution, that's a hoax. Kids don't know. Mm -hmm. They're in, in middle school or high school, they're incredibly impressionable. They don't have a basis for being able to say, this is what science is and what you're saying isn't science. They don't have a basis for saying, actually, I know what evolution is and it's not a problem. And so, you know, if a teacher is teaching evolution and the parents have a problem with it, the kid comes home and says, oh, do you know what we learned in school today? We, the teacher said blah, blah, blah. And then the parents call up the school and they complain to the principal. They might complain to the parent, to the teacher. Uh, and sometimes the, the administration is supportive. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, if the administration says, look, we, there's nothing... They're, they're teaching what the standards say. They're teaching what the textbook says. They're teaching what every expert would tell them to teach. I, I, you know, I, I appreciate your concerns, but how can we deal with this outside of class? But sometimes administrators don't have a science background. They don't know what evolution is. They don't know what climate change is. They don't know exactly what science is and how to distinguish the scientific issues from the issues that are not scientific. And that's that's a really that's a huge part of of it, and something that's we often tell teachers as a, a way to solve these problems. Sometimes it's it's worth just bringing the the science teacher and the social studies class bring those together for one day, and okay, we're going to talk about evolution. There are a bunch of issues there. It's controversial in society. There's a complicated history. There are interesting philosophical issues that come up. Let's talk about this if you have questions, you know, and, and the teachers can then divvy up the questions. Mm -hmm. If it's a science question, the science teacher talks about it. If it's a history, philosophy, religion question, the social studies teacher talks about it. 
and you model that distinction for the students. So I mean, if they don't yet understand the nature of science, the, the teachers can help model that of, of how you draw those lines between science and non-science. And that, that demonstrates the reality of <laughs> reality being interdisciplinary uh, right. as well, so which, which is something that's hard to do in a, in a school system where everything is split up by subject. Right. So what about, um, do you, what do you do when you run into, I mean, do you have parents ca contacting you if their students are being not taught evolution or if they're being taught something alternative to it in, in class? What, what happens then? Yeah, I mean, we, it's, a lot of our outreach is through science teacher meetings and, and things like that. So I think teacher, more, a greater fraction of teachers know about us than a fraction mm -hmm. of parents, which is unfortunate. Uh, so a lot of the, the calls that we get are from parents, um, you know, that the, their kid came home, and it's often there's some other inciting incident. Mm. So there was a case in Arkansas a few years back that we heard about through the ACLU where it was a, a middle school world history class that the teacher was starting 6,000 years ago with Adam and Eve. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And so that's a problem, right? I mean, not, not good. But what, what got her, the, the parent so upset was that they were getting ready for the middle school graduation ceremony. And she said, hey, this year, instead of having the Baptist minister from town give the, give the invocation the way that they do every year, could you have my Methodist minister from outside of town do it just this once? Mm -hmm. And the head of the PTA or whatever, rather than saying, oh, thank you for your suggestion, I'll consider it, hit reply all and said, look at this moron, how could she think we would possibly do that, right? So, I mean, not that a minister should be giving the convocation anyway, but <laughs> right. perhaps not be like overtly hostile to anyone else's religion along the way. Uh, and so that's what got the parent pissed off, and in as a consequence, it came out that, oh yeah, the world history class started 6,000 years ago with Adam and Eve. So, you know, it's, and, and there was a case in Ohio where it came out that a, a kid in a, it was also a middle school class, the teacher had, with a high voltage device, had burned a cross in one of the students' arms. Oh, I, I remember hearing about that one. Oh. What? Yeah, I mean, that was and, awful. and that's a case where it was, that became public in the spring. The incident had happened, I think, in December. Mm -hmm. And the, the father was an insurance salesman in town and had made some complaints to the school district, but it wasn't until he finally filed a lawsuit, uh, which meant that basically his insurance business had to shut down. No one would do business with him anymore because he filed this lawsuit. In the course of things, it turned out that the teacher had been teaching creationism, he had a stack of Bibles in the classroom, all sorts of other stuff that was really problematic. Uh, but the fear of that retaliation, uh, of what happened, of, of the, the ostracism by the community, made him not want to come forward for as long as they did. Oh. To, to, you know, so the, the natural response, if someone burns a cross in your kid's arm, right, is to grab a baseball bat and head down there and have some yep. conversations. <laughs> but... But they, but you know, it's it's hard, and so when 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 people, that's why I say when people come to us, um, they've usually they've been doing a lot of research on it, they've been thinking about it a lot, and and they really just need someone to hold their hand and say that they're doing the right thing, and talk to them about a way to resolve these issues sure. that doesn't blow up like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What yeah. would you suggest? I mean, many parents. Um, may not have a scientific background, but they want to ensure that their kids are getting a good scientific background, how uh, would you suggest they deal with a teacher who's not being entirely scientific in the classroom? Like, how do you help your, your kid, your student, um, learn and deal with that? I think part of it is, is certainly meeting with the teacher, talking to them, just putting the concerns on the table. Mm -hmm. And even if, you know, sometimes people don't know what's happening. I think it would be, I think every parent, on back to school night at the beginning of the year or at parent teacher conferences should ask the science teacher, should say to the science teacher, I think evolution is really important. I think climate change is really important. I hope you're teaching it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think teachers are hearing that. I think that they're, they know that it's a politicized issue on the other side, that there's a lot of intensity from people who don't want these things taught. I think if every parent who wanted these things taught 
just said, I support you in teaching these things. Mm -hmm. I think that would make a huge difference. Uh, and, and if they know that something bad is happening, I think the first step should be a, a very polite, very honest, very open conversation with the teacher. Because a lot of times the teacher, it's not malice. It's not a deep, dark conspiracy. The teacher just got some bad information someplace, mm -hmm. uh, maybe thinks that this is what they have to do to avoid having people harass them. Yeah. So <laughs> giving them a little nudge the other way may be enough. And, and things can escalate from there, and, and every situation is a little bit different. Uh, you know, sometimes a good solution is to offer, I know, I know this scientist who studies this. Maybe would you be willing to have him or her come in and, and give a guest lecture? Or, or come in and talk with you after class and, and just discuss the issue, talk about the lesson plan and talk about the current state of the science. This is, I mean, especially with climate change, where the mm -hmm. science really is progressing pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. If you were, if you compare the, the IPCC report that came out this last year, the physical basis of, of what we know about climate change, compare what, what we know now to what the IPCC report in 1997 would say mm -hmm. when I was in high school, right? So if that's the last time I learned about, if that's what was the basis of what I learned about climate change in high school or in college that I'm teaching now, I would be, t that would be science denial that I was teaching, right? I would be saying, well, we think it's probably getting warmer. Maybe people were involved. We're not totally sure. Consequences, yeah, it could be okay. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's wrong, right? That's just wrong. <laughs> but 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when a lot of teachers were learning about this, that's sort of where the science was. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't have to be malice. It could just be that they never had a class that covered climate change. They've picked up what they can here and there. They got some bad information. Mm -hmm. You know, and not all teachers, even if they have a biology degree, have taken an evolution class. They may not have studied it. So again, they're picking things up from here and there and just having someone sit down and say, where are you getting this from? Mm -hmm. And have you looked at, some, at these great resources that are out there? Understanding Evolution from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, it's a great website with lesson plans and resources and all sorts of great information that can help a teacher you know, It's with an up-to-date lesson plan. What's the current science? What do we know? What's the best way to teach about these things? Um, journals like Evolution Education and Outreach that are dedicated to talking about how to teach about evolution. There are a lot of great resources and, and similarly on, on climate change there's something called CLEAN which is C-L-E-A-N-E-T Dot org, which is a, a curated collection of online teaching resources for climate change and energy and, and some related issues. So, you know, there are great resources out there. Teachers may not have come across them. Um, obviously, NCSE's website, ncse.com, all sorts of wonderful stuff there. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you know, just connecting them, just pointing them to those things may be enough. And, and if that doesn't work, sometimes, you, you know, you might have to go to, a, to the superintendent or the science chair in the school and and try to work through the bureaucracy and, and that's that's someplace where it can be useful to, to give us a call at NCSE and just because we've we know how bureaucracies tend to work and can get get a feel for what's likely to succeed in this particular instance because every district is a little bit different the rules are different the structure is different the personalities are different so figuring out the right way to go through um, so that so that you don't no one if you if someone tells you no that can sort of shut things down but if you can get enough people to say maybe mm -hmm. until you get to the person who will say yes that's ideal I'm sharing out those links on the event pages oh, um, there's evolution.berkeley.edu which is the evolution one you mentioned and then clean net if it's mm -hmm. spelled with, it with just one n it's confusing yeah, it's yeah, C L E A N E T dot org. But I'm sharing those out so you guys can bookmark that and share that around. Um, Georgia, I'm wondering, did you have did you actually run into any uh, such issues when you were teaching? I mean, it may not have been climate change when you were teaching, but for evolution. Yeah, no, you know, I really was um, kind of out of the classroom by the time it really got to the public. 
okay. venue, I guess. Um, so I guess in a way, um, it was lucky on my part. Um, but I would, but you know, I would just say in general, um, the kinds of strategies that Josh is talking about, you know, basically just keeping a conversation going and keeping a conversation open, and not being so either hostile or controversial in a sense that that things shut down. You know, then you always have that possibility of of somebody, you know, coming around and, and, you know, learning and seeing, you know, what the science is and, and what is the correct thing to, you know, be teaching in the classroom. And so um, just from, I've just been thinking here that, you know, that kind of strategy is what I used, you know, for all kinds of issues that come up in the classroom as you're teaching with parents and because you're, you know, you've got a variety of students and parents out there and, and it seems like there's always just going to be something, but that strategy um, is, it works for all kinds of issues and um, for parents out there, you know, to, yeah, go to the teacher first, you know, is always good and try to have that conversation start there. Um, and then having the support of others and resources out there, you know, really does. It just that you're not alone is such a big help. So um, having a site and a group like this is really key. Um, it can make all the difference. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Guido. Guido's in Germany. Um, he said, uh, it's a sad thing this is even an issue today. Teaching evolution in Europe doesn't seem to be a big problem. At least I've never heard of any teachers here in Germany encountering resistance like they do in the US. Um, Josh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what the situation is like nationally in the US and whether you've heard of the, the differences or similarities abroad. So I mean, one of the things that makes things a lot harder in the US is compared to most other countries, I'm, I'm not, I don't know the particulars of the German education system, but most I countries... It's similar to ours, unlike the rest of the EU. But that's yeah. right, yeah. But you know, for the most part, there, we have 17,000 school districts. <laughs> And they're all fairly autonomous. Um, you know, the, there are state boards of education that set standards, and the school districts take those and turn that into curriculum. School districts select textbooks. They generally keep an eye on what the standards are doing because that's what the tests are based on. And if the state does textbook adoption, then the textbook adoption is based on what the standards say. But there are 50 different standards. Uh, Fewer now because there's something called Next Generation Science Standards, which is an attempt to have a consistent, the same science standards for every state, which is surprisingly radical. Yes. Um, and, and because evolution and climate change were both our, our central themes in, in how those standards were written, there are some states that have tried to block adoption. Wyoming, the legislature, forbade the adoption of Next Generation Science Standards because they include climate change. Mm -hmm. A lot cool. of them. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so in a lot of the world, it's, it's a national curriculum, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, I know in, in Turkey, for instance, where there's a fairly active creationist movement, when, when the Islamist parties are in power, are part of the governing coalition, if the education ministry is, is given to, that, to the Islamist parties, they print textbook, the, the, the Ministry of Education prints new textbooks every year. So when the Islamist parties are in power, they take evolution out. Mm. And then if the secularist parties are in power, they put it back in for the next year's edition. So it, in, a, in a case like that, it can be problematic. But in general, if we had national science standards uh, and na a national science curriculum, the nature of this problem would be really different. Mm -hmm. uh, it, what tends to happen in Kansas when I was there, in a lot of other states when, when there are efforts to water down what's in the state standards, there's a, a political backlash and the people who are trying to put creationism or climate change denial into state standards get voted out of office mm -hmm. and, and good science gets restored. When p people don't pay attention to school board elections, to state board of education, it's just, it's obscure. Um, but when they do start paying attention, when there's something controversial like that, then uh, it, it tends not to stick. We have a, a question or a suggestion slash question from Michael Jobin. Would a teacher say to students that we are teaching science, not theology? Are there theology courses in, in college or grade school or at these different levels we're talking about? Um, how 
it, it depends on public or private, but maybe how can the teacher bring in the theology? Like, where does theology fit in the education system? There, yeah, I, I don't think that there are probably any other than than a religious school uh, that there. Are, going to be theology classes. Mm -hmm. Some schools might have a comparative religion class. Um, and in my ideal world, every, every student would take a comparative religion class because I think it's really important to understand where, where all of these conversations are coming from and how different people are coming at, at these big questions. And I think part of the reason that we have these fights is that evolution does raise big, interesting, complicated philosophical questions about what does it mean to be human? What happens to us after we die? Do we have souls? Right? These are not trivial questions. And how students respond to the science is shaped by their understanding, by how they interpret it in light of those other questions. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge range of religious responses to evolution. Um, as, as to climate change and to lots of other scientific questions, to the Big Bang. Uh, you know, there's some people who, who do think that it's just their, their theology says that they can't accept evolution. And there are other people who, who integrate it thoroughly into their theology. Yeah. Francis Collins is the director of the National Institutes of Health, right? He's an evangelical Christian who thinks evolution is, is good stuff and is <laughs> the way that we're going to, understanding it is how we solve cancer and how we find the next antibiotic and how we solve these in critical medical issues. So yeah, there's a huge range and understanding that I think is an important part of, of addressing the, the conflicts that we see. Yeah, I went to a Catholic school for from kindergarten through the end of high school <laughs> and I got a really strong science background. Like evolution yeah. was not an issue. We taught it, we talked about it. I did argue with a, a nun in my religion class about evolution once, but that was in a religion class. Right. It was never, never an issue for my biology classes. When I was in Kansas, when, when bad things were happening, there were people who weren't even Catholic who were talking about sending their kids to Catholic schools because they knew they would learn evolution there. They, yeah, for us, where we were location-wise, they knew my parents knew I'd get a better education there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Let's see what else. Do, what else? Uh, I'm, I'm, the, the comments keep moving around in the Q and A. Yes, so one from Nancy. Thank you. I get confused. Is that okay? So this is from Nancy Graciano. Um, what are your feelings about those states where legislation is either proposed or already passed, which mandates teaching creationism disguised as intelligent design? So I that's something you hear a lot about too, and maybe you could talk about how that kind of plays a role. Intelligent design. Yeah. So in intelligent design is is this form of creationism that's sort of vague about the the particulars. If you look at if you go to like Ken Ham's creationism museum, where he's got the ark and the whole thing, he's really specific about when everything was created and how and who did it. And six days, six thousand years ago, there was a global flood. Noah saved all the animals. The whole thing. Intelligent design is more like well, at some point, somehow. Some sort of intelligence. We don't know exactly who. God. I'm not uh, saying it was aliens. <laughs> right. It, it could be aliens. It could be fallen angels. It could be time travelers genetically engineering the past. It could be anything. We don't know. So, yeah, it's, it's meant, meant to get around the, this long history of court rulings that say you can't teach creationism. Mm -hmm. And in 2005, there was a, a court case where a, a federal judge looked at it and said, yeah, this is the same old creationism, the same rulings apply. And since then, since 2005, and actually a little, starting a little bit before that, we've seen a different strategy. So there, well, I was going to say that we haven't really seen laws require, that would have re required creationism, but in the last couple of years, there have actually been a few weird bills filed. But the big thing that we're seeing are what people refer to as academic freedom acts, mm -hmm. which sounds really great, right? It sounds, how could you be against academic freedom? Who doesn't love freedom? Mm -hmm. But what these are doing is trying to redefine academic freedom so that it would say, if you're a parent, if you're a student or you're a teacher, you can't be punished for encouraging students to think critically about all these controversial topics like evolution and climate change and often climate... Evolution, climate change, chemical origins of life, and human cloning are the four topics that are specifically mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
human cloning not really being something that usually comes up in a high school science class. Didn't mind, but that's because Gattaca came out that year. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think that that's a, a cryptic reference to weird abortion yeah. stem cell research sorts mm -hmm. of issues that, um, that the religious right gets worked up about, as they do about evolution, and other people on the political right get worked up about climate change. So that's what unifies those four topics, right? It's not their scientific status, right? It's not that they're scientifically controversial, it's that they're politically controversial and that people want to make hay out of that. So mm -hmm. laws like this passed in Louisiana and in Tennessee a couple of years ago, and there have been, I, I'm not sure what the current count is, but 50 some odd, uh, almost 60 that have been filed in the last decade in, I think, 13 or 14 states, or maybe up to 15 even. So it's, it's something that the Discovery Institute, which is the, the institutional home of intelligent design creationism, has been, they, they, they developed this as model legislation that they've been shopping around, and um, other people on, in the, the political right and, and the religious right have, been, have taken it up as, as their issue as well. So, and that's something that we, we've worked with local activists a lot to try to get them to, to fight back against those. And it's something where it's, it's hard because it sounds, it's academic freedom. How can you be against that? How can you be against critical analysis? But the practical consequence is that it makes it that much harder for an administrator to say, you have to teach evolution. Mm -hmm. It's in the standards, it's in the curriculum, it's in the textbook, you have to teach it. And, for the, and the teacher can say, I don't want to teach it, or I'm going to teach both sides, you know, and and it's just a little bit harder. It's it's one more barrier for an administrator or a parent who wants to say this is not okay. Well, it was creationism first. They couldn't get that passed. It was intelligent design. They couldn't get that passed. So it feels like this was the next step in ways that they could. And the arguments of intelligent design are, the arguments of creationists are fundamentally, if you look at, what in the when they were requiring equal time laws in the 1980s when you know equal time for creationism and, and evolution the a lot of the creationist arguments even there are negative arguments they're attacks on evolution right so the claim now is oh we just want to teach critical thinking by examining both sides of evolution but the arguments that they want to present against evolution are the same old creationist objections they just take out the and therefore god did it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we're getting some really great comments. I don't think I'm going to be able to get through all of them. Some of them is just discussion, and, and I, we appreciate all the discussion going on. Um, mentions of the fine spaghetti monster, of course, as, as if you're going to give equal time to... Uh, that's kind of how that joke started, is if you're going to give equal time to creationism, you have to give equal time to my god, the flying spaghetti monster, um, which has become a very popular meme. Um, Guido points out that religion is a separate class in Germany, taught as a theological history class. Mm -hmm. um, Academic freedom uh, from Sylvan Westby is granted for research, but not for teaching. Um, uh, yeah, so some... Uh, oh, here's, here's a good question from, uh, from Sylvan Westby. Um, I guess this is for if a teacher is in a place where he or she is uncomfortable, um, and you know you have, uh, and I'm going to specify that not just religious community, but specific people who are, you know, denialists of evolution, um, do you continue to teach it in the class in a more subdued way, or do you just go ahead and teach it and risk the parents taking their kids out of the school? I don't know if this yeah, is. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it that's tricky, and it's something that that a lot of teachers experience. There, you know, I, I in in no state does a majority of the public support teaching only evolution. Hmm. This is really? some some survey research that uh, some researchers at Penn State did a couple years back where they aggregated poll data, a lot of different surveys that people had done over the years asking questions like that. And even in Massachusetts, which was the, the, the most evolution-friendly state, it was only about 40% who, who endorsed only teaching evolution. The, the idea of teaching both sides, teaching... Wow. It sounds so appealing. Right. This is... There was a, a couple years back, the, uh, the Miss USA pageant had the, the, the contestants come in and, and sat them down and asked them some, quest some spontaneous questions, just not in front of an audience, just in front of a black backdrop, 
and video the responses. And one of the questions they asked that year was, should evolution be taught in school? And something like 37 of them, in the, in the, I transcribed them for my sins. I <laughs> sat there and I transcribed this video. And something like 37 of them, in the course of that, said something, made some reference. The question was, should evolution be taught in school? Not, should both sides be taught? Should creationism be taught? Should evolution be taught? Spontaneously, 80% of them almost said something about, we should teach both sides. Wow. Well, we're teaching creationism, so we should teach evolution also. You know, it's, it, it was just, that's, it's deeply ingrained in our mindset. It's deeply ingrained in the conversation. And it appeals to the idea of fairness and, and all of these values that are, are really, they're good values. We should value fairness. We should give equal time to all points of view. The problem is that it's not about points of view. It's about evidence. It's about what's, what, what is science and what's not. And that, that's really hard because in the broader public discourse around these things, it's not just about science. It's about a whole bunch of other stuff. And so I think a teacher in, in a religious community like that, it, it's, it's a really tough challenge. And certainly one of the things that people do, the, the question uh, talked about, you know, should you talk about gradual change over time rather than using the word evolution? And sometimes that can be a really effective strategy, at least to start off. If you think that students have been sort of primed to, to think bad things when they hear the word evolution, to think bad things when they hear the word Darwin, mm -hmm. yeah, just sort of introduce... The idea, one thing I, I, I often will do when, when someone wants to pick a fight over, over people sometimes just call us in the office because they want to pick a fight. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so everybody, creationists, everybody across the spectrum, if you agree that you can do DNA fingerprinting and track back the human family tree, right? No one disputes this point. The creationists think you can track it back to Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of us don't. But <laughs> yeah, you know, DNA, you can make a family tree of humans. So I say, all right, well, let's take a chimpanzee, throw that into the mix. You still produce a tree. You can still, that's, you have that same tree. Throw a gorilla into that same mix. You still can produce a tree. Throw gibbons. So, and the basic mechanism is not in dispute, right? They agree that you can get an accurate family tree by taking a DNA sample and doing this thing. So... Talk about it. Don't, don't, I mean, I wouldn't use humans as the first example in this scenario, but you could take, well, we know we can do that for humans. Now let's do that for dogs. We can do that for dogs and figure out the dog breeds. Now throw in wolves. Now throw in foxes. Now throw in bears. Now throw in cats. Mm -hmm. And the, the basic ideas of evolution, the idea of adaptation, the idea of natural selection, the idea of a tree of life, you can develop a lot of this without using the word evolution, without, without talking necessarily about human evolution until, until you've gotten people to basically accept the idea and then say, okay, so we're talking about evolution here. The same thing works for humans. Is this so scary? <laughs> it's because the implications that seem to be scary. Yeah, and a lot of people, if you say we're going to talk about evolution, they think we're going to talk about how, it means that you're going to talk about how God doesn't exist and how souls don't exist and how people are just animals and it's, you know, it's going to be a discussion of moral philosophy and all this other stuff. And so if you just say, look, we're talking about gene frequencies and we're talking about selection and we're going to, and a lot of this is pretty obvious stuff. Once you get it, it was hard to figure it out the first time, but now that we know it, it's actually pretty straightforward. Right. And once you get into it, it's not that scary. And then you say, that's what evolution is. That's what we've been talking about. What did you think it was going to be? Let's right. talk about that. Let's, let's air that out. Let's put it on the table. Sure. And maybe that, and that's a good place to bring in the social studies teacher and say, you know, there are some other issues that come up around this. Let's talk about that with the social studies teacher here and distinguish the scientific issues from, from the other ones. And we can talk about all of them, but let's draw those distinctions. Yeah, that's a great conversation to have with the class and I bet you could, you know, you could do that unpacking just with the idea of science and what is science too because um, that's very interrelated to all this as you mentioned and sometimes people, you know, don't have a great idea of, you know, 
what does it mean for something to be scientific? What kind of evidence is scientific evidence? Um, it's not just, you know, like people's opinions, like you say. So having that sort of conversation so that people are really sure of what we're talking about when we say science, and this is scientifically accurate, just like, you know, and maybe not so scary, <laughs> and with all the negative implications that sometimes people come to the table with um, about that word, too. So just getting all that out there. Yeah, and to start the, the nature of science conversation yeah. with yeah. something that's not as, as, as contentious either. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you right. Use an example of something that's not science that everybody agrees is not science. That, uh, or, or a case where the, the phlogiston or the celestial ether, mm -hmm. you know, something that, or phrenology, you know, right. that, that nobody <laughs> takes seriously now, but that was taken seriously at some point. Yep. and talk about how, how, we how it was decided that that wasn't science. Uh, and then use that as a basis to build on. And the, the same people who produce the Understanding Evolution website also have a site called Understanding Science mm -hmm. that has a lot of great resources for talking about lesson plans uh, for different age levels all the way down to elementary school to, to talk and, and up to general public, uh, you know, adult audiences, to talk about what science is and how science works and how to move beyond the, the sort of boring, trivial, and really wrong um, linear scientific method idea that first you do some research, then you form a hypothesis, then you make some predictions from the hypothesis, then you construct an experiment. The things we make the science fair kids do. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fine framework, but it's not how scientists actually do what they do, right. and it's worth talking about how mm -hmm. scientists do what they do, and that it's it is this human process and that peer review is an important part of it and that scientists are humans and they do stuff for stupid human reasons and that that's okay because science has ways to correct for that and to catch us when we're doing stuff for stupid human reasons rather than for smart human reasons and that it's it's a collective enterprise you know to talk about all those different parts of it and and how that leads us to be really confident that evolution happened and is happening to be really confident that climate change is real. Uh, you know, that these are not, it's easy to think of science as a collection of facts, as an encyclopedia, just a bunch of knowledge. And you can say, well, I've, I, you've got a whole bunch of books that say evolution is true. I've got a book that says evolution isn't true. Take that, scientist. <laughs> and so understanding where that comes from, how do we know wh where, where, understanding the process, that it's not just a bunch of facts, but that those facts had to go through this process, that they were vetted by a lot of different people whose first incentive was to try to knock down the established knowledge. Right. That that's a really valuable part of the process, and, and that's why scientific knowledge is so important and is such a, an important way of, of doing things. And it's something that it comes naturally. We all do it for all sorts of things. If the car doesn't start in the morning, you do an experiment, right? That's how you figure out what's broken so that you can get it started again. Right. Yeah, I think, I think that's good um, on both sides to <clears throat> separate the, the science, the scientific facts from the potential implications, interdisciplinary philosophical implications. Because um, I personally have seen it on both sides as well. I see religious people and non-religious people doing that uh, in their arguments, probably mostly in the heated online arguments that are never, well, yeah. not never, but usually not a good idea. And it's really good to pull out, here's, here are the facts. Um, let's not go overboard. Um, and, and with climate change, I feel like that must be a particularly tricky place to be because it's not, you know, where is this creationism debate's been going on for the 20th century in, in, in pop culture or the popular uh, sphere. But we're really new to climate change, <laughs> as you said it before in every sense. So what is, how does that change your, your strategy in dealing with these issues with teachers and parents um, with regards to climate change? In some ways it's easier, and in some ways it's harder. You know, as we were saying before, the, the science is changing more rapidly. We're learning a lot more, and so it's harder for teachers to stay on top of, and it's easier for bad information to slip in. Um, it's, it's new, so it's not in the standards often. It's often not in the textbooks. Right. And the teachers don't necessarily know whether they're supposed to be teaching it. Or, or they all can sort of point their fingers at somebody else and say, 
oh, I'm the biology teacher, that's for earth science, and then nobody takes earth science classes, mm. and it, there are really important physics and chemistry issues that come up around climate change, and it could make a really interesting practical way to talk about how, you know, about a lot, of, some interesting physical processes and chemical processes, uh, but those teachers probably aren't thinking that that's part of what they're supposed to be doing. So just getting it into the curriculum, just getting teachers thinking about how do they have those discussions. But the fact that it's new, part of the problem with evolution is that for 80 or 90 years now, people have been thinking that as part of their identity, if I'm going to be a good Christian, mm -hmm. I, if I'm going to be the right sort of Christian, I can't accept evolution. Right. This basically starts after the Scopes trial, that the fundamentalist movement, which at that same time was moving from being an urban intellectual upper class movement to being a rural lower class anti-intellectual movement, mm -hmm. it becomes anti-evolution. It, it yeah. takes up William Jennings Bryan's mantle and as a matter of, of identity says we have to reject evolution. That's a really hard dynamic to break. Yeah. If, you, if you think that you ha in order to be a good person you have to reject this science which is more important, Yeah. right? <laughs> Being a good person, going to heaven, eternal life with your loved ones, or getting the science right. Yeah. It's not a contest. I mean, I wish it were, but it's not. And so that's deeply ingrained. This, the idea that there are two sides, there's evolution and creationism, is, is really built deeply into American politics at this point, and it's a hard dynamic to break. Climate change, we're not there yet, although... I worry that we're, it's getting close. You see in, in the last election, a lot of the Republican candidates had at some point endorsed climate change policies, right? Newt Gingrich sat down on a couch with, with Nancy Pelosi and did an ad for Al Gore's nonprofit to talk about how everybody agrees we should do something about climate change mm -hmm. and went up on stage during the, the campaign and said that, you know, oh, everyone makes mistakes. That was my biggest mistake ever, right? Yeah, it seems <laughs> like it's probably think he made worse mistakes, but yeah, yeah. but the idea like that he thought he had to do that yeah says that suggests that it's becoming a matter of personal of of political yeah. identity yeah which is really scary if that if that takes hold it's not necessarily religious personal identity but it's a political economic personal identity exactly thing. Yeah. yeah yeah so the it's it's the same psychological process just with a different set of motives yay um. <laughs> Uh, Atsurin uh, says the thing about teaching both sides, because um, this is a this is a topic we talk about with media too, um, is that even if it actually were a controversial topic, the controversy should be tackled in academia by science, not given to for kids to confuse them. If a topic is controversial, the place is not in schools. Um, do you uh, tend to agree with that? To a degree, uh, you know there there are. I think there's a lot of research that shows, and, and intuitively it makes sense, that students respond well, they, they engage more deeply with topics when there's a chance for them, when it's not just presented to them on a platter. Right. If there's a chance for them to explore the ideas, using argumentation and debate in the classroom can be a really effective pedagogical approach. The pro and, and the problem is using a science class to debate things that aren't science. Right. So having, having students do independent research uh, and come up with their own sense of how much sea level rise we should expect by the end of this century as a result of climate change. That's a really, that could be a really interesting debate. Every student then has to argue their position based on the literature, based on what they've read, and defend, defend where, how they got to that. But to argue about whether climate change is happening Mm. We're past that. It's that's not a, a live scientific controversy anymore. Mm. Were dinos which dinosaurs had feathers? That's a really interesting question. We know that some of them did. Some of them do right now. Mm. We know that, and there's there there are tyrannosaurids that have fuzz on them. Mm -hmm. There were probably tyrannosaurus with feathers, right? That's crazy. <laughs> there's some suggestions that you can find that there was fuzz on Triceratops, which is the other big branch of dinosaurs. Yeah. So maybe all of the dinosaurs had feathers, maybe just some of them did. Maybe it was eco an ecological adaptation, but they all had the genes to produce them. 
this is an area of ongoing research. Right. And so in a classroom, that would be a lot of fun to debate. But not, did dinosaurs evolve? Right? <laughs> right? That's, we're, we're past that. And also, and you're so, not asking the yeah. students to decide the answer to the question. Because we don't know yet. And you're not asking, you know, I feel like asking students to decide for themselves means they're going to pick a side and stick with it. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. If the data doesn't exist for something such as which dinosaurs had feathers, you can't let the kid just say, I'm going to believe this now. And, and the, the people who have done a lot of the, the research and, and have been advocating this argumentation method in classrooms make that point, that, that the goal is not that, they should, that students should reinvent science, right. but that, that the teacher, where, where there is something that is well established, that the teacher's job is to... Use, use the argumentation to help students understand how we got to that point. Mm -hmm. How did scientists reach that consensus? And where there's something that is, is a legitimate live controversy within science, to understand how scientists are, are using the tools of science to resolve those questions. And there's a, a paper that um, Jeannie Scott and Glenn Branch wrote, it's probably 10 years ago now, about the, the teach the controversy rhetoric. How do you decide what a what what is a real controversy? Mm -hmm. What are the what 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 are the criteria for a legitimate controversy to be talking about in classroom? Not just in terms of is it a real scientific controversy, but is it pedagogically appropriate? Are the do the students have the background that they would need to understand it? I mean, origin of life. There are some really interesting. It, it pedagogically, it could be really interesting because there's a lot of different ways to come at the question, there's a lot of evidence for a lot of different hypotheses, and we don't have a good answer. But for a high school student to be able to debate that, they would have to understand a lot of chemistry, a lot of geology, a lot of biology, a lot of physics, crystallography. There's just a whole bunch of complicated science that they would have to have in order to have that conversation. So it's not a great topic for a high school classroom. But it could be interesting as, as an introductory college class to get people to dive into those, those interesting scientific questions and use the, the question of how did life get started as, as a, an entree into basic chemistry, basic geology, basic biology. Sure, yeah. Uh, we have one more question I want to get to. Um, I know, Georgia, you have a meeting if you have to run. Oh, the school. I will. OK. Um, um, this is, uh, again, from Nancy Graziano. Uh, she says, I'm glad my daughter has already graduated college. I don't have to deal with this. Um, but wh what recourse do scientifically literate parents have when their kids are subjected to creationism and intelligent design? I think we can add climate denial in there, climate change denial as fact. What if, worst case scenario, the teacher's teaching that and the administration's not budging? What can you do for your, I guess, your kid's education? Right, and, and Nancy's question says with no evolution to balance, but it right. doesn't matter if someone balances it, right? It, it, <laughs> intelligent design uh, or, or other forms of creationism just don't belong in classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, it's, it's a First Amendment violation, and it's teaching kids stuff that's not right. It's not science. And teaching stuff that, something as science that's not science in a science classroom is not just misinforming kids about evolution, which is a really important topic, it's teaching them something wrong about what science is and how science works. Mm -hmm. And that's going to follow them for a long time also. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the first thing that I would always say, step zero, is, is contact us at NCSE because every situation is a little bit different. Right. Um, you know, we, we have friends who are lawyers. We have, if it comes to that, although the hope for the most part is that it doesn't, Lawsuits are really rough, and they're not fun for anyone. Um, you know, sometimes they're necessary. In in the case, in in Dover, Pennsylvania, where that that lawsuit was filed, it wound up being cathartic for the community to be able to have a judge come in and say, "You're right, you're wrong, you pay them a bunch of money, <laughs> that's it." You know, but for the most part. It's, it's really hard to be a plaintiff, and we, we don't try to put anyone into those shoes. We, we want to resolve things quietly and behind the scenes if it's humanly possible. So, uh, so we can talk people through that. But certainly starting out by having a conversation with the teacher, especially you know, if your kids are coming back and saying, this is what we were taught, 
sometimes kids don't aren't always paying close attention in class. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, what? I, I hate. I, I know. You should hear what kids tell teachers about their parents. Yeah. Oh Not always the whole story. So so it's certainly you know, check it out. The, Go, going to the teacher and not not going in making accusations, but just saying, my kid said this, and <laughs> maybe something got lost in translation here. Can you tell me more about this assignment? Yeah, that's good. Open yep. ended, not what the hell are you doing. <laughs> our, our philosophy is always that you, you can always escalate. You can always move up the chain of command. You can always be more aggressive. You can always threaten lawsuits. <laughs> But if you go in threatening lawsuits, or if you go in saying, oh my god, what the hell's wrong with you? Why? Are, what are you doing to my child, you monster? That's, that's going to shut down the conversation. And it's going to be a lot harder to have any sort of open exchange, any sort of, of satisfactory resolution, any sort of meeting of minds, um, if, you, if you go in aggressively to begin with. You can always get aggressive, but once you've gotten aggressive, it's, a hard, it's really hard to walk it back. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and we do, we, we run this uh, this webinar series at NCSE, and there's one that we have, the, the video is archived on our website, where we talked about some of this, of, you know, what do you do if you have a conflict in your community, how do you resolve it, um, and I can, Nicole, I can send you a link to that. Sure. I don't know if I have it right at my finger, to, uh, actually, I can pull it up pretty quick, hold on. Um. Uh, Nancy then, also adds that I'm going to demand that Santa Claus be taught in science classes. Right. It's a really, actually, there's a really interesting physics um, way to teach physics about using Santa Claus. <laughs> Matt Lowry <laughs> does it in high school. Fun. Yeah, it doesn't end well for Santa. The thermodynamics. Yeah, the thermodynamics of Santa Claus, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the, the step zero in any sort of conflict like that is definitely to to give us a call at NCSE because we've mm -hmm. every every situation is different, and and sometimes we've we've dealt with something similar in that same community before, and we can we know the landscape a little bit. We know oh, this is the person to talk to. Mm -hmm. This happened before, and this was the whatever, this was the, the administrator who helped out and give them a call and, and it'll all get patched up really quick. Or, yeah, this teacher does this all the time and we don't have a good angle on it yet or whatever it might be. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much for having this conversation with us. Um, I'm going to do a few quick announcements and then we'll wrap up and you can tell people, remind people again where to find all this information. Um, so this I didn't is... sneak out, so I'm just going to say okay. hi, everybody. Thanks, and thanks, Josh. It was great. Great to talk. Thanks for having me. Okay. Okay. See you next week. Um, so we are at Learning Space this week. Next Friday is the Weekly Space Hangout, uh, hosted by Fraser Kane. We'll be covering the news stories of the week starting at noon Pacific. Of course, we will talk about the gamma ray burst that didn't exist. Uh, speaking of the nature of science, uh, if you were on, on the internet last night, all the astronomers went bibbly crazy because it looked like a gamma ray burst may have gone off in, in, in our nearby galaxy of Andromeda. Uh, and after several hours of follow-up and analysis, it turned out it didn't happen. Uh, it was a bump in the data. So uh, if any of you guys saw that, um, you should uh, check it out. I'm sure we'll be discussing that on Friday. Uh, Sunday night is the weekly... No. Sunday night, the virtual star party weather permitting for uh, our, our astronomers scattered around. Uh, they seem to be centered in the west coast of the U.S. Uh, they will be giving you live views of the night sky through their telescopes, through their webcams, through all that good stuff. That starts, I think, Sunday at 9 p.m. Pacific now. So it's a bit late for the rest of, of the U.S. And, and, uh, but that, that'll be um, that one coming up. Monday, I'm going to go, um, I know Pamela's on travel again, so I'm not sure what the astronomy cast schedule uh, shows at the moment, but they usually do astronomy cast if they can at noon on Mondays. And then we come back to Wednesday, and we do learning space, and as I pull up the schedule, oh, uh, we will be, same time, same place, we will be talking about, oh, actually that one may have changed time. 
and date. Um, we were originally scheduled to talk about the Challenger Learning Center, um, but we had to reschedule that one. So stay tuned to the schedule. We'll, we'll have something up next week for that. Uh, Josh just shared the link with me for um, how to respond to attacks on science education from the NCSC website. So definitely check out the, the NCSC website for a lot of these uh, resources. And Josh, do you want to have any parting words of advice or, or resources people could use? Um, you know, the NCSC's website has a lot of great resources on it, um, and I definitely would encourage people to check that out at ncsc.com. I mentioned ev uh, understanding evolution and understanding science. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in the process of working with UCMP to create an understanding global change website as well, which is going to be really exciting when it comes out, um, I think, next year okay. or late this year. So. Um, and if, if people are looking for, for good resources on debunking climate change denial or evolution, you know, creationist claims, talkorigins.org is awesome. Mm -hmm. There's a, an index of creationist claims. So if someone comes at you with something weird, you can always go there. And uh, skepticalscience.com oh, yeah. does, does the same thing for climate change, and it's really great. And I'm going to have, in, in an hour, I'm going to be doing a webinar with, John Cook from Skeptical Science and Shauna Thiel from Media Matters for America. We're going to be talking about how to debunk and respond to science denial. So there's still time to register. Where can people register? Is it on the site? Uh, yeah, if you go to our website, you should be able to find a link somewhere. Okay, cool. Yes, so thank you. Thank you for joining us, even though you were already all kinds of scheduled today. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm in webinar mode, clearly. Webinar mode, okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for the great discussion, the great questions. Um, this is, of course, a really interesting and nuanced and important topic. So um, thank you again, Josh, for, for joining us and having this discussion with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks, thanks everyone, for the great questions and discussion. Thank you. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.